I just spent hundreds of dollars installing a completely new power system in an old $3,000 camper. Why on earth would you do that? Stick around and I'll tell you why, along with explaining the what and the how of doing it. There were some challenges in this project, but probably not the ones you would expect. And it was actually pretty easy to do. Hi, I'm Gary, and I make videos about technology subjects that interest me from the perspective of an everyday user. I do happen to be a retired engineer, but I try not to go in for either techno babble or market speak, just plain information. If you happen to follow this channel, I probably should apologize for how long it's been since my last video. After a two month vacation away from home, I bought a 25 year old Jayco pop up camper that needed some work. At my age, that sort of thing doesn't happen quickly especially in the middle of the last several weeks of heat wave. In any event, that camper unintentionally led to the making of this video. It was actually in pretty decent shape for its age, so I wasn't planning on messing with the electrical system, which consisted of a 12 volt lead acid battery on the trailer tongue and a conventional RV power converter to charge it and to power the 12 volt loads. Three lights, a water pump, the fan and the heater, and a propane gas detector. Pretty standard for its day. But we do mostly dry camping without hookups. Even I am used to being able to charge my phone. And this camper had no 12 volt outlets or USB power points anywhere. So I added a couple of these surface mount USB charging points connected to 12 volts and considered it done. Problem solved. At least for me. However, we are sharing the camper with my son and his family, and between them they have four phones and a couple of tablets to be kept charged. And he works remotely sometimes, which means needing to be able to use a laptop. No campground hookups means no laptop power. So for their first trip, I stuck in one of my small portable power stations and a portable solar panel. That was okay for a day or so, but it obviously was marginal for longer term use. And it was also temporary and generally in the way. So I said to myself, self, this is the perfect opportunity for a modernization project, which is what this video is going to describe. Now I can't help being an engineer, so I'm going to start with requirements definitions. What exactly was this modernized system supposed to do for us? My list was actually pretty short. More energy storage than the existing lead acid battery. Convenient solar recharging. 120 volt AC power when dry camping for laptops or whatever. Some way to know what's happening with energy storage in use. And finally, an out of sight, out of harm's way installation. The last one actually turned out to be the hardest requirement as you will see. For the others, I'll tell you up front what design choices I made and why. First, I chose a 100 amp hour lithium iron phosphate battery from Lee Time, which is two to three times the usable capacity of my lead acid battery. Lithium iron phosphate is generally safer than lithium ion, which is what all my portable power stations use. If you doubt that, you might check last week's news reports on the lithium battery fire that blocked Interstate 15 for two days. The built-in battery management system on these batteries makes them fairly abuse tolerant, which matters in a camper battery because they tend to get ignored after installation. Lead time seems to have built up a decent reputation in the last few months, and they happened to be having a sale at the time. Also, they offered this battery in a Group 24 size instead of the larger Group 31 size, which gave me at least the option of using my existing battery box. There's no room on the trailer tongue for a bigger one. I also bought a 20 amp lithium iron phosphate charger from Lee Time for charging from AC when the camper is plugged in, because both the price and the specs seem reasonable. It's totally automatic, so it can be buried away somewhere. For solar recharging, I did buy a PWM charger from Lee Time as well, 
but only because it was so cheap I thought I might use it for the lead acid battery or something else. For this system, I settled on the Victron 100 volt 15 amp Smart Solar MPPT controller. In case you don't know, MPPT stands for Maximum PowerPoint Tracking, which means it's able to extract much more of the available power from a solar panel than the simple PWM type. Why this particular charge controller? Victron has a good, if expensive, reputation, and this controller is actually quite cheap for what it does. Because it will handle up to 100 volts of solar panel input, I can series connect two or more of my portable solar panels. And it works with the 35 volt flexible panel I bought to store in the camper, which is not usable with my portable power stations because of its higher voltage. To top it off for an additional $15, the controller came with built-in Bluetooth, which works very well, so I can monitor all the solar power information without needing to see the controller. Producing 120 volt power from a 12 volt battery obviously requires an inverter. Remember, this is a 10 foot long pop-up camper where everything in it collapses to less than three feet high. There's no microwave or room for one. The fridge runs entirely on propane when you're camping and the battery is limited to 100 amperes max. So it isn't gonna be able to power hair dryers or other higher power appliances, even if I wanted it to. A 600 watt inverter has been adequate in my motorhome for years, so that's what I settled on. After reading a lot of reviews, I chose this Giondel Pure Sine Wave unit for about $100, primarily because it came with a remote switch panel, which isn't all that common in small inverters. Since I intended to mount it out of sight, the remote switch was very important to me. And last but not least, I cheaped out by buying this battery monitor, which was only $18 at the time. It's doubled in price since, but it's still cheap. Its big advantage over most of the other cheap battery meters on Amazon is that it measures current flow both in and out of the battery instead of only in one direction. This model has a 100 amp current shunt, although I intended to fuse the battery at only 50 amps, so I could have used the cheaper 50 amp model as well. That pretty well takes care of choosing components, although you will see that my design includes some minor stuff like switches and a fuse block, and of course wire, which used to be negligible for this sort of project. But the price of copper means that six gauge wire, for example, is almost a dollar and a half per foot. So I had an incentive to keep the installation compact. Now let's talk about the actual installation. The simplest way to do this would have been to replace the lead acid battery on the trailer tongue with the lithium one, rewire the existing power converter, and then stuff the other components in wherever there was room. It would have worked, but it wouldn't have been pretty. And for no good reason, I sort of wanted to keep the original system usable. It was also important not to mess with the trailer weight distribution very much. We bought this camper because it has a base weight of under 1,600 pounds and a gross weight limit of only 2,500, which means it can easily be towed by a midsize SUV. But its tongue weight is thus only about 160 to 200 pounds, and the existing lead acid battery accounts for a big chunk of that. I had a trailer wreck some years ago due to towing stability problems and my wife would definitely quit speaking to me if I messed this up. So all that lead is staying put on the tongue. Making that choice, of course, leads to more questions. The most important ones are, then where do I put all this hardware? And how connected or not are the old and new systems going to be? It would have been possible to use one of the existing storage compartments at the expense of losing the use of that space. But a much more attractive alternative was to use the space behind the existing power converter and wiring. The only problem is there was a hot water heater occupying most of it. It wasn't working, and a previous owner had bypassed the water connections, but it was still taking up space. Personally, I think a 6-gallon hot water heater and a camper with only a 10-gallon water tank is a waste of space, especially for dry camping. 
so that space was up for grabs, and removing it could also help preserve the existing weight balance in the camper. The first order of business, therefore, was taking it out, while preserving the outside frame that covered the big gaping hole in the side of the camper. That meant cutting and removing the propane line that was still attached to it, which then had to be capped off underneath the camper. Fortunately, there was a fitting there to put a cap on, although the clearance is so low underneath that I almost had to have help getting out from under it. I replaced a unit like this on my motorhome some time ago. It's actually quite easy. If you remove the screws inside the frame, the water heater comes right out. Doesn't it? <laughs> no, it doesn't. After much pushing and pulling and grumbling, it turned out to be riveted to the camper shell on the bottom. What idiot thought that was a good idea? As it turned out, there was a reason for it. The lifting cables for the roof were right behind it, and using screws might have damaged them. So the rivets had to be drilled out. And then it came right out. But I still needed the frame, which is permanently attached to the rest of the water heater. A cutting wheel and an angle grinder turned out to be the right tool to separate the part I needed from the rest. That was actually kind of fun, because it made a lot of sparks without hurting anything. I could then grind down the edges, cut and paint a piece of plywood to fill the hole, and screw it in place. Because this panel was going to be awkward to access once it was screwed back on the camper, I mounted the Victron solar controller directly to the inside of the panel and ran a wire through a hole to an Anderson connector on the outside. I like these connectors, because they're easy to plug and unplug, and once they're assembled you can't plug them wrong. You do need a crimping tool for them, though. This bit was the most work in the entire project, but at this point there was now a large volume of space available for mounting this pile of components. It took a bit of fiddling to decide how best to locate them. Should they go like this? Or like this? Or this? Eventually the choice came down to this arrangement, because I thought it would keep the wiring short, not slop over into the other side of the compartment, and make it convenient to reach the switches. Here's everything fastened down and connected together. I made my own hold-down brackets for the battery charger, because I bought the cheaper version that didn't have mounting flanges. And I put the battery in a tray rather than a box for ease of access. That does make the terminals a bit more exposed, but all the live points are covered, except some wires on the switches and fuse block where I forgot to use shrink wrap. I'll need to tape those up. And here's the view on the outside. I think it meets my out of sight goal fairly well. The only thing showing are the dedicated 120 volt outlet from the inverter and the inverter on off switch and the battery monitor display mounted on the front of the kitchen cabinet, which has to flip over to collapse the camper for travel, by the way. I modified a diagram I found online to show the general configuration of the new system, but it doesn't really account for the old system, so I thought it might be informative to show a series of circuit diagrams that illustrate the progression of the whole project. I did these by hand and then modified them in Photoshop, because I'm too lazy to figure out how to do it with the CAD program I have. Here's the original system. That's pretty much all there was to it, just a battery, the power converter and distribution unit, and some wires. As I mentioned, all I originally intended to do was to install some USB charging points. Hang on, because I'm going to go through the rest of this pretty quickly. We start with adding the lithium iron phosphate battery, and then its AC charger and a switch to disconnect the battery from the rest of the system. But you can't actually connect it directly to the 12 volt distribution system, because connecting two dissimilar batteries together would do bad things. That meant disconnecting the old battery and wiring it back through a switch and a fuse block to the system. I also disconnected the 12 volt output from the power converter, and ran it directly to the old battery, so it could charge it even if it was switched off. Then, the inverter is connected to the battery, through a 50 amp fuse, because that's all the current a 600 watt inverter would require, and the other loads are comparatively small. 
It has its own dedicated 120 volt outlet to avoid messing with the existing 120 volt wiring. In my motorhome, I did this with a transfer switch, but there's really no point in that here. And of course, there's the inverter remote on off switch. Then we have the solar charge controller connected directly to the battery with its outside connector for a solar panel. And the battery monitor has its current shunt in the negative battery line with a cable going to the display panel. That's the complete system. The two switches allow you to choose either battery as a power source, with the loads being none the wiser. The inverter only runs off the lithium battery, but it can do that even with the old battery carrying the other loads. You may find it odd that I use two separate switches, since it's possible to turn both of them on at once and accidentally connect the batteries together. I did that because all the single two battery switches I could find will also connect both of them directly together if you rotate the switch the wrong way. By using two separate switches, there are 20 amp fuses in between the two batteries. If you do it wrong, there shouldn't be any fireworks. I mentioned at the beginning that there were a few issues with this project. Finding the space and removing that water heater was the biggest challenge, but it was ultimately a success. I intended to plug the battery charger into this outlet inside the cabinet, but I hadn't checked it carefully in advance. It's really a fake covering a junction box. So the charger will have to be plugged in outside when it actually gets used. Not a big deal. The one real glitch is that when I got the wiring all finished, somewhere along the way, the original power converter developed a shorted output. I don't know if disconnecting it from the load panel caused that or not, or if it's temporary or a permanent failure. So right now I can't plug the camper into shore power until I track that down. If it's a permanent failure, I may just disconnect it from the system and charge the old battery with the PWM solar controller I bought. We'll see. Everything else has worked so far. The 100 amp hour battery produced 105 amp hours on its first discharge. The charger recharged it in five hours as expected. And the inverter ran a 500 watt lamp without complaining. And just in case you're interested, the cost of the components totaled about $564, which seems reasonable to me for what it does. If you stuck this out to the end, I hope you found the video interesting. Feel free to ask questions or to comment on how you would have done it. And please consider giving it a like and are subscribing to the channel. I'm a very part-time YouTuber, but there will be more videos. As always, thank you very much for watching.